straight ahead on Law and Crime Daily. The evidence found in the heartbreaking murder of an Iowa college student out jogging. Did Christian Bahena Rivera kill Molly Tibbetts and leave her body in a cornfield? We had a hard time finding something negative about Molly Tibbetts. Mother of five, Jennifer Dulos disappeared two years ago. A sneak peek into the new movie and documentary about her life and presumed murder. She's angry. She knows she's got a problem. And then suddenly this guy turns on the charm to bring her back in. That 70s show actor Danny Masterson is ordered to stand trial for three charges of forcible rape. Why a jury could hear evidence about the Church of Scientology. Doomsday cult mom Lori Vallow Daybell is declared indigent as her defense attorney agrees to keep representing her. And prosecutors try to link the murder of Robert Durst's best friend to the disappearance of his first wife in 1982. Was the millionaire real estate heir abusive to Kathy with Terry Austin? Prosecutors have rested in the Iowa murder trial of a college student found dead in a cornfield. Law and Crime's Anjanette Levy is here to explain why where Molly Tibbetts' DNA was discovered is so important. Yeah, Brian, DNA is really a key part of this case, along with the statement of Christian Bahena Rivera to law enforcement. This cornfield became a crime scene on August 21st, 2018, after investigators said Christian Bahena Rivera led them to the area where he left Molly Tibbetts' body and covered it in corn stalks. Crime scene technician Amy Johnson found Tibbetts' black running shorts and underwear nearby. She also examined Bahena Rivera's trunk and found blood in four areas. It was the rubber seal located um, near the license plate area on the rear of the vehicle. DNA analyst Tara Scott tested that stain. The DNA profile that I developed matched the known DNA profile of Molly Tibbetts. Scott said she also found another spot on the trunk liner after prosecutors asked her to re-examine it. The profile that I developed indicated a mixture of three individuals. I was able to determine a partial profile at 20 out of the 21 locations that I tested of the major contributor, and that was consistent with the known DNA profile of Molly Tibbetts. Scott said there were other blood stains found in the trunk, but the DNA was simply too weak to develop a profile, something the defense focused on during cross-examination. I cannot include or exclude anybody from those mixtures, no. You can't exclude Christian Bahena Rivera from that? I cannot include or exclude. Bahena Rivera's attorney also raised the possibility that Molly Tibbetts' blood could have been placed in the trunk by someone else. DNA won't tell us how it got there, right? Correct. Won't tell us if it was transferred there, will it? Will not. Will not tell us if it was dropped there, right? Correct. Won't tell us if it was scraped on there, right? Correct. Just tells us what it is. Yes. And the special prosecutor in this case seemed to get a little agitated when the lead state agent on the case testified. Um, agent Trent Valletta said that they looked into a number of other suspects, possible suspects in this case, including Molly Tibbetts' boyfriend. But he said they didn't find any evidence tying any of those other individuals to her disappearance. Were you able to develop any information from any of the men, including Dalton Jack, uh, any information from any of those men that they made admissions that Molly Tibbetts was in the trunk of their car? No, just Christian Rivera is the only one that told us that. That puts her in the trunk. Agreed? Yes. Does it put him stabbing her? Uh, no. Okay. And the prosecutor then asked whether or not Bahena Rivera claimed that he had blacked out at some point during his interaction with Molly Tibbetts when he became angry, and he confirmed that that was indeed true. Brian? Thanks, Anjanette. Joining us today is criminal defense attorney Anna Young and Terry Austin. Anna, multiple sources of DNA in Bahena Rivera's car and potential contamination. How do the defense's arguments uh, hold up after cross? You know, I think the defense, Brian, is trying to work with what they have here. And I think the defense attorney made some good points when he was saying, listen, you, you don't know how the DNA got there. You don't know how it got transferred there. You don't know if it was placed there. We just know that in some portions the DNA was found there. So I think, again, he's using what he has. But the fact that there's DNA in that car, that's pretty damning evidence, and that's a big strength for the prosecution. 
Yeah, Terry, talking about damning evidence, Tibbetts' blood in the trunk fits the confession. Could Tibbetts' blood being in the car tie this case all together when you think of all of the testimony? It could. And you know, Brian, the job of the prosecutor is to tie all the evidence together. So they don't have the actual confession because that was actually omitted because of the Miranda warnings. But they have Rivera admitting both to Agent Valletta and to the interpreter, Romero, that he led them to where the body was and he explained, you know, how it occurred. So they have that and the prosecution can tie that together. That, along with the blood in the trunk. And one last thing, Brian, none of the other witnesses ever talked about leading them to the crime scene, none of the other suspects. So I think if the prosecution can tie all that together, they will have a good case. Now, and Jeanette, the defense also questioned the DNA analysts about DNA in the home where Molly Tibbetts was staying, right? <laughs> That's right. And they're trying to raise this possibility that there was another man that no one knows about or somebody that could have attacked her in her home and taken her out of the home against her will. Um, they questioned the DNA analyst about an Arnold Palmer drink can that they um, swabbed within the home where Molly Tibbetts was staying. That's where she was living with not only her boyfriend, but his brother and his, her, his fiance. And they said that there was an unknown male profile a DNA profile on that can, and it was a mixture with Molly Tibbetts' DNA. We don't know whose that was, though, and they did not take DNA samples from the boyfriend or his brother. All right, well, like, as you said, the prosecution has rested. The next step is potentially to see whether or not the defense puts on a case. Of course, we'll give you that update as it comes along. Thank you, everyone. Still ahead on Law & Crime Daily, the new order from the presiding judge in the Doomsday Cult duo case. But first, the disappearance of a Connecticut mom of five two years ago, we speak to Dan Abrams about his new movie and documentary coming out about the Jennifer Dulos case next. Welcome back. A Connecticut mother was last seen alive two years ago. A new movie looking into the Jennifer Dulos case by Law & Crime Productions is set to premiere on Lifetime. And we've got a sneak peek for you right here. Fotis. I want to have a family with him. This morning, mother of five, Jennifer Dulos, was reported missing. Based on a true story. You need to find her husband. That shook the nation. Whatever happened to Jennifer, he is behind it. Annabeth Gish. Warren Christie. People make all sorts of horrible assumptions. They don't know me. I'm innocent. Gone Mom. The Disappearance of Jennifer Dulos. Premieres June 5th, only on Lifetime. The story of missing mom Jennifer Dulos has captured headlines here at the Law & Crime Network. Joining me now is the founder of the Law & Crime Network and executive producer, Dan Abrams. So this is based on the very high-profile story of a mother of five who disappears, and it becomes increasingly evident that the police are focusing on her ex, Fotis Dulos. And the story kind of unravels as time goes on. Jennifer was last seen dropping her kids off at school on May 24th, 2019. Police believe her estranged husband, Fotos Dulos, killed her. Her body has never been found. I mean, Fotos Dulos had a bad temper, and you see that in the film. And Jennifer Dulos, um, you know, was put in a horrible situation. She became a, a victim of, of domestic violence. Surveillance cameras captured photos Dulos and his then-girlfriend Michelle Truconis dumping trash bags on the day Jennifer disappeared. There are five children who are alive today who don't have a mother or a father, and we try to be as best we can respectful of that fact. Now, Dan, with so many questions still being asked in this case, where does this movie start and where does it kind of take us through on this journey? Yeah, so... It, it, look, it starts from uh, the perspective of Jennifer, and she is uh, talking about how she, you know, she could use a break. She could use uh, an opportunity to go to the beach, et cetera. She was a prolific writer. So what the producers here tried to do is to tell the story in part through Jennifer's own words, the words, the thoughts that might have been going through Jennifer's mind um, at the time. And this is you know, shortly before things go, go south. Now, Gone Mom is the movie, but you're also taking viewers through an inside look into the case in a new documentary called Beyond the Headlines, The Jennifer Dulo Story. How are you bringing this gripping story to life in a documentary? So in the, um, in the Lifetime movie, you see actors, and in particular one central character, 
playing her best friend. But in the documentary, you see that that character was actually based on a number of her closest friends, each of them providing a really unique insight into Jennifer, into her relationship with Fotis, et cetera. And that's all in the, in the documentary version of the, uh, of the story. Jennifer's family have released a statement on the second anniversary of her believed death. Although this past year has understandably slowed the process, the investigation into Jennifer's death and disappearance is ongoing. After the courts reopen, the two people charged with conspiracy to murder will stand trial. Photos Dulos was charged along with Michelle Traconis and friend Kent Mahaney. Dulos died of an apparent suicide last January. Mahaney and Traconis are awaiting trial for conspiracy of murder charges. Traconis is due in court on Tuesday. Back with us is criminal defense attorney Anna Yum and Terry Austin. Terry, in the two years since Jennifer Dulos' disappearance, what has been the biggest twist in this investigation? No doubt the biggest twist is the fact that we now have Fotis Dulo gone. He is now, you know, committed suicide, and they won't be able to try him for the crime of potentially killing his wife. And not having him available means that they can't use one against the other. So I think that's probably the biggest issue that the case is going to have to face. And the question is whether or not there's ever going to be justice as far as Jennifer is concerned. Yeah. And Anna, not having photos Dulos does a number of things, because right now we only have Kent Mahaney and Michelle Troconis being set to try. Now, we've seen cases where there are murder trials without the body, and those are hard. But what about murder, uh, conspiracy to commit murder without a body? Is that harder? Right. Excellent question. I think absolutely, if there's a murder charge without a body, those cases are so difficult to prove for the prosecution. But I think it's going to be a little bit easier for the prosecution in the sense that they're charging them with conspiracy, right? So they're going to be focusing on the efforts that were made, the overt acts that were made between these two defendants to show that they had a plan in place, that they were conspiring to get this done. And of course, they're going to rely upon things such as the alibi script, and, and the cell phone pinging and any kind of communications between the two. Now, of, co of course, like Terry was saying, it's more difficult because Float is not there. But it, at the end of the day, I think it's going to be a little bit easier because it's going to be focusing on the overt acts and not necessarily the fact that there's no body. Yeah, I mean, there's a saying for it, and at least two former presidents would agree, it's not always a crime, but sometimes it's the cover-up that gets you caught. So we'll see how that plays out as these two go towards trial. Coming up on Law and Crime Daily, the actor ordered to face trial after three women accuse him of forcible rape. Plus, how Robert Durst's alleged actions against his missing wife are coming into trial involving the murder of his best friend. The new testimony you don't want to miss. We're back. A judge is ordering actor Danny Masterson to stay in trial for three charges of rape after women accusing him took the stand at a hearing, saying that that 70s show actor attacked them. After days of emotional testimony, a California judge ruled three women's statements were credible enough to support the charges. The women told the court Masterson raped them between 2001 and 2003. The judge said there's evidence the policies of the Church of Scientology discouraged them from reporting to the police. Masterson is a prominent Scientologist, and all three women are former Scientologists. Masterson has pled not guilty. His defense accuses the women of seeking financial gain. He's due back in court next month for a new arraignment. Masterson faces up to 45 years in prison if convicted. All right, let's bring in criminal defense attorney Anna Yum and co-host Terry Austin. Terry, the allegations by the alleged victims were enough to bring this case to trial. Is any more needed from the prosecution to get a conviction? Or is it all right there? Yeah, you know, probably that's all they're going to get at this point. You know, it's been over 20 years, and you're going to have to rely on the testimony of the witnesses and what they have to say. I doubt at this point if there is any DNA evidence, unless they were able to collect some way back when, and we haven't heard any information in that regard. There could also be some digital evidence, maybe phone records, maybe texts, maybe emails, but I think, again, it's been so long that it might have been more difficult to gather that type of information. So I think it's going to be based all on what witnesses have to say. Yeah, it could end up really being a he said, she said, with maybe some corroboration from outcry witnesses. 
and the defense is clearly saying the alleged victims are after the Church of Scientology, could the defense drag the church into the court as a type of alternative suspect? I mean, I think the defense couldn't make that argument. And I think the defense is really going to harp on what they're saying right now, which is this is just all about money. And we know that there's a civil lawsuit involving the church. So, of course, they're going to try to drag the church in and by saying this was the church. It's all about the church. This was not about our client. And our position all along was the fact that this was consensual sex. And to Terry's point, it's absolutely right. Because so much time has come by, it's really going to be a matter of he said, she said. And of course, the jury's going to have to think about potential underlying motives here. Yeah, we could, because I, I know for most people, the Church of Scientology is kind of shrouded in mystery. This could be the case that pulls back that shroud and tells us the inner workings of that church as we see how women and men are affected in different ways. Can we see that there may be some rules when it comes to our, our rules, I'll say, uh, to reporting this type of thing. So we'll definitely learn a lot more as this case continues. When we come back, new questions into the finances of the so-called doomsday cult mom, Lori Vallow Daybell. One Idaho judge's order on the other side of the break. Welcome back. Prosecutors in the Robert Durst trial are presenting evidence they say ties the murder of his best friend to the disappearance of his first wife. The real estate heirs accused of murdering Susan Berman back in December 2000. Prosecutors allege Durst shot Berman because she knew too much about the disappearance of Durst's first wife, Kathy, in 1982. On the fourth day of testimony, an emergency room physician spoke about treating Kathy just one month before she was last seen alive. Given the history and the exam, one would assume it was from inflicted trauma. Okay, well did you notice any underlying disease within her body which would have caused the black eye in just her left eye? No, sir. Okay. In your opinion, was this inflicted upon her by someone or something? Yes. Okay. Was this injury consistent with being punched in the face or yes. slapped in the face? Yes. Have you treated domestic violence victims in your career in the ER? Yes. Would you say hundreds of times? Yes. Was this injury consistent? I'm not saying uh, it, you know personally that it was caused by, but was it consistent in your experience with the type of injury you've seen caused by incidents of domestic violence? It could have been. In your experience and training, how recent were these injuries? The fact that there was bruising noted <clears throat> would indicate that it was probably several hours or longer old. Okay, well, was this days old or within hours, you think? Can't tell. And there are a lot of moving pieces in this trial. Alleged domestic violence is now another. Is this painting a large picture for the jury, or could there be too much on this canvas? You know, Brian, I think there's too much on this canvas, and I think the prosecution is just throwing whatever they can against the wall to see what sticks, because this is going to be a very tough case for the prosecution. Keep in mind, the defense is really going to argue the fact that there's no forensic evidence here. A lot of time has passed. There's no DNA, no blood evidence no fingerprints, no weapon. These are all things that the defense attorney mentioned in his opening statement to articulate that this is going to be a case about pure speculation. And that's what the government is doing, if you see in the testimony. Could this have been consistent with her getting a black eye? Sure, but even these witnesses are saying that they don't have an opinion as to how it got there. So I think that the prosecution is just working with what they have and throwing everything up there to see what they can do to muddy up the defendant so the jury doesn't like him. And I think that's, that's what they have to do because they've got a lot of lack of evidence, in my opinion, in this case. Yeah, and there's definitely a lot there to make him seem unfavorable to most people. But the question is not about being unfavorable, it's about being guilty. Well, of course, we'll keep eyes on that and law and crimes. We got a camera in the Robert Durst trial and we gave you gavel to gavel coverage on everything Robert Durst. Now to Idaho, where the so-called doomsday cult mom, Lori De Daybell Vallow, is being declared indigent. Vallow and her husband, Chad Daybell, are charged with concealing evidence related to the deaths of Vallow's two children. The bodies of 7-year-old Joshua J.J. Vallow and 17-year-old Tylee Ryan were found on Daybell's property. The couple's expected to go to trial together, but have different attorneys. According to a new order, Vallow Daybell has limited funds to pay her attorney, Mark Means. EastIdahoNews.com reports Means will continue to represent her. Vallow's being held in the Madison County Jail. She's due back in court on July 12th. 
Terry, so she's still going to have the same defense attorney, but how could being indigent affect Vallow's case going forward? You know, Brian, I don't think it's going to affect the case very much. She is entitled to being declared indigent and getting assistance if her income reaches a certain level or if she's on public assistance or if she's currently serving a jail term or if she's in a mental institution. And I think based on uh, those issues, we think that it's probably because of the income. And so she's entitled under the code to everything that you would be entitled to if you weren't declared indigent. So that means investigation, that means expert testimony. So she'll get whatever she needs. And she's got the same attorney. So I'm certain he's going to continue on the path that he already is on. Yeah, it could, this is a very common thing that people hire attorneys and they run out of money because it is expensive to keep up a criminal case. I'm sure many people are probably uh, commenting that she wishes she didn't fly to Hawaii right now and maybe saved a few dollars for this defense. Uh, but like you said, same defense attorney, keep going forward. But they're also going to get tried with her, with her husband as well, correct? And he's got a paid attorney. Yeah, I mean, I'm assuming that he has a paid attorney. Obviously, he does, and that he's going to continue doing so. He hasn't been declared, to our knowledge, indigent as yet. All right, Terry and Anna, thank you. And thank you for joining us here on Law and Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.